Welcome to episode 154 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On this week's episode, I chat social media and digital and athletes, the good, the bad, the ugly. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host who looks up to Shaquille O'Neal because he's so damn tall, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes. Who doesn't look up to Shaquille O'Neal, uh, a NBA legend and now a uh, podcaster, much like myself. I don't mind listening to uh, Shaq's podcast, the Big Shaq podcast on Podcast One for a laugh every now and then. Uh, Shaq doesn't take himself too seriously, um, but as a businessman, um, he's investing in a lot of good things as a part owner of the Sacramento Kings and also investing in esports. He is someone I want to eventually get on this podcast. My name is Sean Callanan, and you're listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. You might be doing so at sportsgeekhq.com, or you might be doing it on your favorite podcast app. Hopefully, it's mine, Pocket Casts. So I've mentioned it now over 100 times, so hopefully a few of you have converted. As always, if you want to reach out to me, uh, sean at sportsgeekhq.com, if you want to try the old-fashioned way, email, or uh, send me a tweet at Sean Callanan. On most platforms, including our Sports Biz Slack community with now over 1,000 sports execs from around the world. Um, This this podcast is an extension of uh, a podcast I've done previously uh, on uh, episode 107, um, but really was triggered by a conversation I had on ABC Sunday Sessions with uh, Kelly Underwood. Uh, I was invited in to talk on ABC Radio um, after some discussion around... Uh, AFL football as an athletes in general, how they're using social media, some of the links potentially to the pressures that they're under uh, with a few footballers uh, putting their hands up uh, for depression as sort of discussed with uh, Blake Solly and the pressures on athletes. So, um, And one of my points that I do make in the, in the interview, which you're going to get in just a moment, is that uh, athletes sort of need this ongoing training and it needs to evolve. So I thought it was worth revisiting what I'd done in episode 107 and how some of my uh, some of my advice has changed. But first, have a listen to our to my chat with the ABC Sunday Sessions crew with uh, Kelly Underwood, Jules Schiller, and Nathan Burke. And after that, I'll uh, have some more thoughts on the matter. Sean Callan is a sports digital expert who has uh, educated young AFL players about social media. He's been good enough to join us in the commentary box here at Docklands on the Sunday session. Sean, welcome. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about the role that you've played in, in teaching young AFL players about social media. Yeah, so I've worked with both the teams and leagues around how to use digital, and social's been a big part of that, and, and the athletes are the targets uh, of, the, of the social networks. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat... They know that that's where the fans are coming. And so they're selling them the... And I've been one of the people selling them that it is a great space to build up your brand um, because, you know, the life of football is short and it becomes a really uh, valuable asset to them from a marketing point of view. If they want to, say, go to a shop appearance or open a new bar or sell some T-shirts, whatever they want to do, you're seeing footballers have all these business lines, that's a really good marketing channel. Um, but, you know, as was said there in the, in the, in the discussion, things like uh, the swim team in 2012 and, you know, the, the, the swimmers reading all the tweets and then getting a, you know, a not well-adjusted view of the world and, and it starts distracting them from the game. So one of the things that when, when I'm talking to, to players is to not let it encroach on the game. The game is their job. And I think that's what Luke Beveridge is trying to say to, to cut it out. And, you know, they need to say, put my phone away. One of the things I say when I'm telling the players is like, have a routine. They're very good with routine. So as you're going to the game, take that shot, do that Instagram post or whatever and say, looking forward to the game and then turn the phone off and start focusing on the game. So it's about getting those processes in place so it fits into their life. Um, because I think saying you can't be on it is, is too extreme because then footballers are pretty isolated anyway. If they can't be on social media and connect with just their friends because they've been on these platforms since they were 13, 14, and that's how they connect with their mates from school and their, their mates who have normal lives, don't have the microscope. Now they can't, 
you know, they can't post where they are all the time. They can't, uh, you know, they have to be manage it a little bit from their own personal brand, but they still want to be connected with their friends and family. So saying to shut it out will only make footballers more isolated than they already are. They're not, they're not communi- you know, they're not out there with the people all the time. And if they're not talking with their friends, it just, it'll become more isolating. Do you actually recommend some players get off? Because, I mean, in the media, and I know certain players, you, you, you know, from time to time you do cop abusive tweets or negative tweets, and you think you can handle them, and, and I think most people can, but occasionally when you're a player like Tom Boyd or Travis Cloak, I mean, it's the sheer volume of it, because the papers kind of, you question their future fans, you know, are automatically drawn to their accounts, and it's the volume, and I've had this, it's the volume that can overwhelm you, and I think that's when issues start. So do yeah. you... Do you it say is, to players, you're a focal point now, you're being, you know, you're being pinpointed in the media, get off? There, there, there is a bit of that. There is a bit of you know, when players are going through a crisis and you know, remember when Kurt Tippett went from Adelaide to Sydney and the Adelaide Crows fans weren't happy about it. And they said, what should I do? I said, just delete Twitter off your phone. It's, you know, and, and give it six months or give it three months and when you're comfortable going back into it, go back into it. I think it is also a platform by platform uh, uh, problem. I think Twitter has you know, recently put up its hand. It has got an abusive... Cobbler. And, it, and, it, and it's got an app that puts all of those mentions right in your face. Whereas Instagram has a lot of those comments and some vile comments on the posts, but if you're just going in and tapping on photos and looking at photos, they're not as in your face. Um, and, and Snapchat's the same. Serena Williams has said she prefers Snapchat because it's more broadcast and not as social. So she puts out a post and not everyone has to comment on it. She doesn't have to read that. Is the AFL a little bit behind the times then when it comes to dealing with social media? When you say the, the elite athletes of the world, the, the uber superstars like, like Serena Williams is on Snapchat, does there need to be more education so they are... Because social media moves so quickly. I, does, I do think that is the case. Like, I've done sessions in the, with the AFL players as the new, new draft kids come out. Yeah. And I've done that. But so you're teaching these kids at 17 and 18 what it is. But they're not doing that training every single year. Like, the and changes might, are might... coming through every, like, weekly. Yeah. Like, and... in these platforms. And so something changes. Like, last week, Snapchat opened this thing called Snapchat Maps. And so you can open up Snapchat, pinch Zoom, and it will show you where all the people are. Mm. Right, and so I used to have to tell all the players in an Instagram point. Oh, God, by the way, don't put geolocation because you know what? I can look at that map, and that's your lounge room, mm. right? So there's these dangers from an athletes' point of view that they're not getting constantly trained to say, "Hey, guys, this is new. I oh, turn this off, otherwise you're going to get caught out." And so it's ever evolving. And the other thing is, the player goes four years after they've had their training as a rookie, and now they're starting to play as a 21, 22 year old. No one's well talked to them about yeah. it. Yeah. And now they're getting all this exposure as a debutante or whatever. And, you know, again, they get all this positive, you know, get your first kick, but then what do they do then? And what happens every year with the AFL players is you, you get your racial and religious vilification talk, you get your drug talk, and it's the same one every single year. And players sit there and go, yep, tick the box, I've done here and done that. So this is something that they should do every year and replace a couple of those. For me, I've got two things. One is notifications in yep. your phone. Turn off your notifications. Completely. Mm-hmm. What you need to do is when you're in the right frame of mind, away from the game, I'm in a really good space right now, I'll sit there and read it. And then when you get the bad stuff, I like to visualise uh, you know the, the comic book guy from The Simpsons, the nerdy fat oh, yeah, guy yeah. with a ponytail sitting behind his computer? Anyone who writes me a bad comment, that's what they look like. And it just says, you know what, I, I don't really need to, to take to heart what these people... To, do you give them tactics and things like that to work it, on? It is just about you control when you read it. Yep. And so again, having that process, if you have a bad game, you know what's going to be in there. And, and you also know what's going to be in the papers and what's going to be in the radio. So if you've had a bad game, do you go and watch all the footy shows to find out you've had a bad game? Do you read all the papers to find out you had a bad game? They don't. Like, they don't from a yeah. traditional media point. They just avoid it. Go, I don't read that. But they, when they open up their phone and do it, they're like, you know, they will get all that but feedback. When you're still buzzing away, you know, 1 a.m. in the yeah. morning after a night game and, and the temptation sleep, yeah. is right there and you can't sleep. And it is a sport trolling. I remember I was getting trolled a lot by one guy, and I wrote back to him and said, you know, aren't you more concerned about your family or other things than me? And he wrote back and said, oh, it's a game that we play. We, we troll people, then we get blocked, and then I take a screenshot of getting blocked and send it to all my mates, and, and you know, you'll go like, ah, oh, Hamish Blake blocked me. Yep. You know, not, you know and, and so it is a sport. It's, it is a and, sport. And yep. you can't take it to heart with some people. So the trick for that is now at least Twitter now has mute. So you, instead of blocking someone, you just mute them. They don't know you've muted them. You never see their stuff ever again. And, the, and they don't get the win of, yeah, being, of getting, under your, getting yeah. under your skin. So, and the other, the other pressure is when you, you do have athletes that do do it well. And like, you know, look at uh, 
Andrew Bogut, who's got a really thick skin, has no problems having a chirp back, and has got a bit of smart to him. There's a lot of pressure for every athlete to be able to do that or to be entertaining, you know. Swanee is killing Twitter all the way from Greece, mm. right? Not everyone is as funny as, as Dane Swan, but the pressure is there to be an exceptional footballer and be super entertaining. You know, that's what comedians do. It's not what athletes do. So there's also that pressure of, oh, I've got to post something great, funny, be interesting, when they just want to be a, a normal person. So when they're under the pump and they're copying it on social media, is your advice to bite back? Because often then the trolls will... will it is part of that game. It is, they're looking like Jules said. So they're looking yeah. for that so what fight. Would, what's your advice to AFL players that... It can be a little bit sensitive. It, it, it is just, don't, you don't give them oxygen. Like, they yep. want that oxygen. And so, you know, if you sit, you're like, not, not worth it, mute, right? But then again, if you're, because if you re, re, uh, go back at one or go back at, you know, a couple, they all go, oh, okay, now the sport's on. Let's see who can rile them up the most. Is it reasonable for a coach to ask his players to get off social media? Because I think there's a lack of understanding that the, the young kids of today, uh, that's their way of connecting with the world. It's how they get Absolutely. their news. They don't sit down at night and watch the traditional 6, 7 p.m. news. It's how they connect with their friends. Yeah, and it's, yeah it is. And that's, uh, that's the unfair bit. I think, you know, if they're on Facebook, yes, they've got to do everything to do around locking down their privacy settings, making it hard. They might use a, a fake name so they're not, not done. But they want to be able to connect with their friends. And so to tell them to cut them off from social media, yes, you go away from this problem, but now they're disconnected from their family and their mates and their teammates. And so that's, that, that's more, I think that's the more problem if you said get off the platform altogether. And you were a victim, Jules, of trolling not that long ago. I mean, how, how did you I apologised. I apologised. <laughs> I, I said know, sorry. Yeah. I've only got three Twitter followers. As a, they all got together. No, I, I, you know what I did? Because it, it, it gets overwhelming. I actually, and I was copying it from everywhere. And people visit your private accounts and get into it. I actually just locked myself in my room in my apartment and ate lasagna and chocolate. Like, really? Like, like, like a Marsha from the Brady Bunch who broke. <laughs> Up with someone, I actually did, and watch Netflix. Yep. It, it gets overwhelming yep. and it's fatiguing. And and I've I've dealt with that both at a play level and a team level. It's about uh, just focusing on the positives and saying you will have your own digital cheer squad and know that they've got your back and they will actually come to to your defence. But other than that, yeah, yeah, just give it some give it a spell. Sean Callanan, thanks so much for dropping by from Sports Geek HQ, a sports digital expert. Thanks again to uh, the ABC crew, Kelly Underwood, for inviting me on. Really enjoyed it. Uh, it is quite strange going into a professional radio box. Uh, they're all lined up. Not much room to to move about there. Uh, but it was good to go into Eddie Head Stadium and and have that chat. And yeah, I wanted to ex- I guess extend the discussion, and it sort of got me thinking what I'd said back in uh, episode one hundred and seven um, when I was sort of talking at. Uh, looking at some of the guidelines around the, the Rio Olympics and what what players are allowed to do and a bit of the pushback of the players. So that one was more of a policy discussion and what the players want to do and what they should do. Um, and so I sort of talked about my number one rule when it's talking uh, with, with athletes is you, you're not there to be – you're not there to entertain. Um, you're not an entertainer. You're not a comedian. And I did sort of touch on that in the, in the discussion – you know, you're a footballer or you're an athlete first, and and secondary is you're a, you're a public figure on these on these platforms. So, you know, the pressure I think um, to to entertain and be witty and those kind of things is is real, um, and to a certain degree, they just need to let that go. And then the second, my primary rule when talking to athletes is um, is my uh, my Arnie Kath rule that I uh, discussed when I chatted with Mark Cuban and his Expire app. Um, his expire, the Expire app is a, is a terrific app for, for athletes. Um, it goes and validates and checks through your feed uh, for things that potentially might be red flagged. Um, I'd highly suggest all players heading into, a, into an NBA draft or into an AFL draft should uh, run Expire app over their, uh, over their tweets and over their posts and it will delete anything that potentially will come back to bite them. Um, but the, yeah, the rule that I've discussed uh, previously on the pod is my, is my Arnie Kath rule. Uh, when I first introduced it, Arnie Kath was 99. Uh, Arnie Kath is now uh, now 100 and uh, going as strong as the rule itself. Uh, my Arnie Kath rule is I don't want to have to write anything on social media that I have to explain uh, to my Arnie Kath. And so everyone's got an Arnie Kath in their life, uh, whether it be a, 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 a Martin or a, or a Nana figure or someone that uh, they don't want to don't want to disappoint. 
uh, that's always been that's always been one of my uh, one of my rules. There was also a study recently I shared it on the Sports Geek Facebook page on uh, uh, the the activity of of athletes tweeting and posting late at night um, and and their performance uh, the next day. Um, again, another rule that I've uh, applied and 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 adopted um, was uh, George Rose Manley's. Uh, George Rose, or when I started working with George, he was working. He was at at Manly, and his one of his rules was he never he never tweets and never posts after after eleven o'clock. And it's not about uh, what he's doing; it's really just he says he don't trust himself. He doesn't trust himself when he's uh, and it's late at night. And it's terrific advice, and uh, the studies show that it does make sense now. Potentially, it's probably advice that could go to uh, the leader of the free world uh, as far as Twitter usage late at night, but uh, I cannot uh, get into that type of area. So what I want to do is sort of recap and go over the five tips for athletes um, going forward and then do a little bit of a platform-by-platform analysis on where I think athletes can use the platforms. So the first one, which I've mentioned in episode 107, um, it's definitely about routine. Um, it's around finding a space and time uh, around what you're doing as an athlete, game day, non-game day, training, non-training, and find out where it fits. Uh, find out where it fits where you're comfortable. Like remember, it's your routine. It's not, it's not the fans. It's not PR. It's not the comms department. It's your routine. So find out where it fits for you um, and then follow that. I think that's uh, super important, especially around game day. Um, if you start both setting yourself as I'm going to do an Instagram in the morning to say game day and then I'm turning my phone off and shutting down my phone, whether it's going into airplane mode or turning it off completely, um, it gets you in that, hey, I'm flipping the switch. And it also, the, the, the other valuable part is also trains your fans to know this is me signing off, getting ready for game day mode. I'll be back later, but, but you know that I'm not going to be responsive in this space. So I think that's a critical one. Uh, the modern day athlete is very much, you know, routine based. They get told what to do. They get told what to train. They get told what to eat. Um, so I think there should be some some definition and routine around what they're doing, and set it to your own guidelines. Uh, don't uh, you don't need to be following the guidelines of what social media uh, platforms are telling you. If Facebook's saying do Facebook lives an hour before or three Facebook lives a week or posting seven times on Instagram, no, it's your schedule. Your fans will appreciate your content and your content will get through to your fans when it gets posted. So develop your routine and stick to it. The second one um, very much uh, follows along what uh, Nathan said in the interview around notifications. You're very much in control. As much as you know, the platforms feel like that they're always pinging us and dragging us back into the, into the network, um, as an athlete, you've got to decide when to use it. So, so the example of the bad game and you're not reading and consuming all the media, it doesn't make sense to be consuming social. So understand when you're using it, why you're using it, how you're using it. Um, understand how, and monitor your mood and how it affects you, whether it is a good game or a bad game. Are you going there, going there to look for validation from the phone? I think it's really, really, really important to understand how it can affect the mood. Um, and really, don't forget that the second part of social media is media. And so, as I said before, you don't go and seek out all the traditional media after a poor game. So you shouldn't be doing the same on, on social. So look for a way to detach yourself from that and remain in control. And if you don't have self-control, then you know consider doing things like deleting apps off your phone and making it harder for you to, to go and grab it and open it up and that kind of thing. If you need to, if you find it is having that kind of a, a, a effect, I think the third one, and this is getting into the place where uh, you know. So there was some preamble before the conversation um, on Sunday sessions before the clip I played with Luke Beveridge, the current premiership coach of the Western Bulldogs, sort of pointing the finger at. I know why the players have got it. They've got it to build up a brand and marketing and uh, that kind of thing. And he didn't want them to have it. Um, it is, from my point of view, from an athlete point of view, you do really need to have an idea of why you are on it. Um, if you are wanting it to be on it from an external benefit point of view, um, I'm very much um, of the opinion, yes, you should be on the platforms because it is super vital to stay connected. Stay connected with your 
your people, not fans, your friends, your family. I, you know, I highly value that. But if you're going to take a public persona in the social space by telling people what your Twitter handle is, by getting verification, by having a public Facebook profile, by having a, a public, public Instagram profile. Um, and yes, it comes with benefits. It might come with uh, uh, products that you can do product placement with and influencer marketing and those kind of things and particular deals. Have know, it, know why you're doing it. If you want to build up a personal brand to drive results to your business or get extra cash via uh, influencer campaigns, then know that's why you're doing it. And then also start training your fans on that's what you're going to do um, because I think that's really, uh, really important. I mean, if you go and build an audience authentically and talking to people all the time and then six months later start running ads and doing product placement, it's going to really jar. So, you know, take your fans and your fan base on that journey if you are going to do it. Um, but, yeah, understand why you're there because if you're just there – for, for an ego, you know, stroke of the ego and, and pump up of the tyres, um, then it potentially could turn really badly, which leads me on to part four and sort of understanding the balance and understanding the game of trolls and, uh, and super fans. Um, and Jules, uh, Jules Schiller there, who was on uh, the Sunday sessions, is correct. Trolling is, is a sport. Um, it's a game for them to, to, to get a rise. And so the reason I put trolls and super fans in the same bucket because they are just the s- different sides of the same coin. Uh, the super fans will completely pump up your tyres, say how wonderful you are, retweet and give you all the love in the world, and it's terrific and self-affirming, but it potentially is just as false as the, the, the negative teardowns that happen on the, on the troll side of, of the equations. The good thing is um, there is now some ability, at least Twitter is starting to address the, the issue. And again, I see trolling as more bigger issue in Twitter than it is on other platforms. Um, they have got now the ability to, to mute new accounts. Um, so Twitter has extended the, the mute functionality to say, if you're a new account and you haven't qualified your uh, email address and, and phone number, um, then you can automatically mute those accounts. Um, but as I was saying on ABC, I would be playing around with uh, with mute versus block, and always using mute, um, and not giving them not giving them the satisfaction of seeing that they've been blocked. Um, if you're just ignoring them all the time because you've, you've never seen it, uh, they are they are none the wiser. Um, and I'm very much a believer in. Uh, then they're not talking back and don't giving them oxygen. I think it does, it does work for some fans. Um, sorry, for some athletes, uh, as sort of mentioned before, Andrew Bogut does a really good job engaging and uh, not taking any rubbish from any fans. Uh, I think KD Kevin Durant was uh, very big on re- replying to a fair few fans after the, his uh, Finals MVP win, um, which you can do, and it's your right to do, um, but. Again, it will only raise the bar for people to to have a uh, to have a crack and to to troll you harder. So, if you don't want that, to, if you don't want that issue, um, for mine, it's just a matter of uh, leaving it be and uh, try to find a balance between ignoring the trolls and also believing everything that the super fans. Um, uh, are asking you so that's my fourth one on on trolls and super fans and then the next one is probably more of the more on privacy and geolocation and it is a place again where Jules said that uh, the trolls and the really active ones can can move into and that's you know invasion of privacy and try to find out as much as they can um, so the, the so the biggest gotcha for athletes has been um, when platforms change settings around geolocation. Uh, so geolocation is photos, uh, tweets, those kind of things that have a, have a place pin on them. And they're terribly accurate, uh, accurate to a point where you can point out the difference between sending a tweet in your kitchen and, and, your, uh, and your lounge room in some, in some instances and things with photos and the like. So Instagram has since taken that feature off um, there was a uh, there was there used to be Instagram maps and you used to be able to go and look at someone's profile and look at where where they've tagged all their photos. 
Um, and, you know, if you went on there, you could say, oh, wow, that's where, you know, they posted a lot of photos from that location and that mo- most of the time that location was the person's address. Um, so that was removed and, you know, Snapchat, Snap Maps um, has just been released in the last couple of weeks and this is a, an example of, I guess, updated tech that's changed. Um, and if you turn it on, it's a, it's a cool feature. It's a cool, creepy feature in that you can see where all your other Snapchat friends are. Now, that's okay. And you can have the setting to be in ghost mode so no one can see you. You can have it so only your friends can see you um, or everybody can see you. So uh, use it at your, uh, at your discretion. Um, obviously, if you start letting your friends see you, then you've got to be a bit more, bit more discerning on who your friends are on Snapchat um, and what they see. So there's that. And then the other side of it is the our sharing on our story. So when you're sharing a, a Snapchat, you have the option to share it to your story. And then there's one for our story. All of those posts go into the public sphere. So if you're at a party, stacks of people are at a party and they're all posting to our story, there's potential for your snaps to end up in a public viewable forum by someone just opening up the map, seeing this activity, clicking on the clicking on the map and it will show all the snaps that are in that region. So again, from a privacy point of view, and whether you're an athlete or whether you just want to protect your privacy, be very wary of what that our story does. Um, that said, um, it's great to sort of surf around the world, see there's a big event on, whether it's a sports event, and see what the snaps are coming out of that are. And so I think the opportunity from a sports side, from a fan point of view, point of thing is really good for Snap Maps. It can really uh, double down on the fan day experience and how awesome it is to be at the game. But from a privacy point of view, it's something you want to be very wary of. I think the last thing I want to touch on um, in these five uh, around privacy is, is just the communications of private versus public. Um, if you're going to respond to fans, um, I'm always of the opinion that it makes more, far more sense doing it in a, in a public forum uh, because if fans um, uh, will fans know that you respond to them privately via DMs, then they'll never talk to you pro- publicly. They'll always think that they can just message you in the DMs and slide into the DMs, so to speak. Um, so... Unless you want to, if, unless that's what you want to do, and you want to talk, talk to people in the DMs, um, it's just something to be very wary of. Uh, fans will be more than more than welcoming and more than happy to contact you and talk to you via direct message and private message because it's a one-on-one communication. Uh, so they're my five, um, I guess, top tips: one, develop a routine; two, know that you're in control; you decide when and where you get to read it. Number three, have a goal, have a bit of a target around what you want to do with your social and digital presence. Number four, around balancing and managing trolls and super fans. And number five is understanding your privacy settings and the impact of geolocation on the platforms you're using. So what I wanted to do now is sort of go through what I would say the big five and the five that I'm currently recommending athletes to be playing around with um, at varying levels and very much uh, matching the platform to the skills and the the appetite um, of a fan so I guess the number one out of the number one at the top of the list uh, by a long way from an ability to reach fans and it is uh, it's chasing down athletes really hard at the minute um, is uh, Facebook um, they want more and more athletes to be on Facebook. They want them to use the uh, the black label Facebook mentions app. Um, if you're an athlete and you have not been verified or you are verified um, on on Facebook, uh, you can do so via the via the Facebook mentions app. Uh, download the Facebook mentions app and link the app to your to your page. Um, the idea is it's meant to give a bit more of a easier experience and and a page to page experience for athletes. So it'll make it easier for LeBron James to comment on Kevin Durant or Cristiano Ronaldo's post. So, so I think that's uh, you know I think that's something that they're trying to get into the space in the same way that athletes have had no troubles interacting on Twitter over the years. They're trying to get that interaction and banter happening on on Facebook mentions. It's still a little bit awkward at the minute, um, but I can see what they're doing. They're trying to make 
the whole experience a little bit easier for the athlete to manage. Um, and, and so, yeah, if you can use Facebook mentions, uh, and, uh, that's the main thing and, and effectively interact with the, uh, the, the, the growing public, the 2 billion people that are on Facebook, um, via your Facebook page, via Facebook mentions. The other side of the equation, uh, you will have a Facebook account. You might use your current, you might use your actual name. You might use a variation of your name to obfuscate and make it harder for fans to find your actual personal profile. I cannot stress it highly enough that you really need to completely lock down your privacy settings. Um, so it makes it harder and harder for you to be seen. Um, I would be also looking at things like not allowing friends and family to tag you on posts, make sure you approve them. Um, and also make sure that anytime you post anything, it can only be seen by your friends and not public. So they're the things you can do to limit your footprint from a Facebook point of view. Um, but the more high profile you are, uh, the less, the my suggestion, the less and less you post on Facebook and really just use Facebook to stay in touch and keep up to date with your friends, um, but not post. Obviously, it's far easier to protect privacy of, of a profile that doesn't have many posts um, because there is always tweaks to the algorithm and tweaks to privacy settings that could see something uh, that currently you think is posted and is thinks private and it could be public down the track. So... That's, that's Facebook. Happy for you to both be on uh, Facebook pages and a personal profile. But again, just locking down the, uh, the privacy. Um, Instagram is currently the biggest growing platform uh, globally. Uh, added 100 million, the latest 100 million in a, in a matter of weeks. It's now 700 million people on Instagram. And again, athletes and celebrities are driving and powering that growth. Instagram stories is a real game changer um, in the influencer market. Um, if you have a verified profile and a profile that's big enough, you can also drive traffic via your Instagram stories. Um, so there is a real big opportunity now for athletes to promote uh, merchandise, products, send people off-site, which is, which is a new uh, revelation for Instagram. And uh, by and large, a lot of the teams that we're working with are seeing really – really high engagement and click through on Instagram stories. So it does provide sort of two different, two different features. Um, so again, the same uh, from a you know, privacy geolocation point of view from Instagram, again, be very wary of if you are going to put um, a location on photos that it may reveal where you are um, and the importance of that. And again, it's very easy in Instagram story to put a, uh, put a tag, location tag on there. Um, but if it's a regular coffee joint or if it's a regular restaurant that you go to, um, just be aware that uh, it does open up the ability for people to find it. That's where you are. Um, so that's Instagram. Again, verification on Instagram is a little bit uh, haphazard. It's not as easy and it's not as straightforward as, as Facebook, um, but it is coming through. It's, it's just a little bit lower on the totem pole from a, from a Facebook's priorities point of view. Um, from Twitter, um, you know, so coming from Twitter, and again, I've been a big uh, advocate of Twitter, but also um, I sort of see where it's placed in the market now, sort of pivoting towards being a bit more of a media company. Um, they were pushing really hard to get the uh, the, the VITs, the very important tweeters. Um, but unfortunately, the, the troll problem, and it is at its peak at Twitter, um, is, is a real issue and it's a real problem. Um, so... At the moment, if new people, you know, new athletes come to me and say, oh, should I be on Twitter? It really is a sport-dependent thing. If your sport is really active, as an example, eSports is super active still on Twitter, then it potentially makes sense because that's where your community is. Um, but, you know, the troll problem, you know, there is a thick skin needed um, if you're going to be going to be on Twitter. Um, I think some of the new app opportunities to mute only look at verified accounts, uh, those kind of things can help. Um, but, yeah, I think the the uh, option for you just to just to look at your own verified mentions, so only seeing it from other verified accounts, which is going to get potentially worse because anyone can now apply for a blue tick, um, 
yeah, it's just really just to figure out if it works for you. But unfortunately, uh, yeah, there will be a lot of mentions um, and not that little, not that much reward. And so, I really do feel for Twitter, especially in the athlete space, because they appear to be to losing that battle and they're losing losing athletes at a vast rate to um, to Instagram and Snapchat. Um, so that leads me to Snapchat. Um, I do think it is getting harmed by uh, by Instagram's innovation. You could call it innovation or stealing product um, with their Insta stories. Um, but that said, uh, Snapchat still has a really strong user base in that eighteen to twenty four sort of market. Um, they've they are continuing to innovate. You can now put uh, links on your on your Snapchat stories um so it's very similar to instagram stories so that potentially opens things up if you want to send people to a particular article or a product and those kind of things um i think the main thing and i sort of used uh, serena williams there as an example uh the main difference with with snapchat is that you decide who you follow and can become friends and everyone else can just follow you so it's it's a it's 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 built a bit more broadcasty, um, and so that limits the amount of trolling and backwards and forwards that you're getting. Um, but it is a matter of finding out which platform you like. It might be, you know, using Snapchat spectacles and giving fans a unique view of the world might be a way to go. Um, but yeah, it's, it remains to be seen who's going to win the battle. Um, it's hard to bet against Zuck when he's in this kind of mo- mode. To, to chase him down and the and the recent uh, snap stock price sort of dropping just below the IPO. Um, it remains to be seen if it can pick itself back up, but uh, I think they'll continue to innovate. And so I think there's, there's an opportunity there for athletes. And I think the fact that they're adding some really cool search facilities, it makes it easier for people to find specific accounts and athletes. So I think there will be growth in the, in the athlete space in, in snap over the, next 18 months the last one that doesn't really get a mention a lot of the time uh when we're talking about athletes and social media it's uh it's linkedin um and i can't talk highly enough of linkedin as a tool for athletes um it's super powerful in i guess connecting with the corporate world um you know one of the lines i like it's you know it's facebook for suits um so it's very much got a professional feel and vibe and so as an athlete, you're, you're connecting with a lot of people who are slapping you on the back and saying thanks and, and uh, wanting a piece of you. And that's where I think you should be at least taking a, uh, if I can say this, a, a passively active role on LinkedIn. And what do I mean by passively active role? I mean, you don't have to be producing a lot of content, but what you should be doing is keeping an eye on the invites that are coming in. You can still decide who you connect with, but connect with them with your future self's hat on. Um, So if you're being connected with sponsors, um, big corporates, uh, those kind of things, definitely connect with them because those sponsors and those big corporates, when they move from job to job, you will then have their contact details. You'll be able to reach out to them. Um, And I think the other opportunity is connecting with someone where you don't know where that connection might go and again an athlete's career could be four or five years or 10 years if they're lucky where is where are the people that you're connecting with now where are they going to be in 10 years when you are going to start as i discussed with nigel smart in the previous episode where are you going to be when you start your business career your second phase of professional work um what these you know where where would this network might get you so i think it's quite valuable so simply by once a month going through Maybe going through the business cards you've been handed in at networking events and the like, connecting with those people at the very least and connecting with people that uh, have potentially hit you up, um, it will make sense. And then the other thing is share a bit of your business story. Like so whether you're doing a sponsor event or, or launching something, um, speaking somewhere, share a few of those snippets on your LinkedIn so people know that you can be booked for a corporate gig that you can help uh, fill uh, fill rooms for, for events, those kind of things. Um, again, because you're a professional uh, athlete, you'll have a lot of people liking it and patting you on the back, but it will potentially 
uh, offer you some work down the track. Um, but again, a little bit like sliding into your DMs, pretty much just just ignore your inbox because you'll be hit up with a stack of I know this and I can help you here. And potentially, you know, you could filter through them, but there will probably be a lot of bad deals and a lot of bad emails to filter through. So for the most part, just ignore it unless it's something unique and someone sort of breaks through the clutter. So that's it. That's my wrap, uh, my updated 2017 look at uh, social and digital for athletes. Um, If you'd like some more info on this, if you've got athletes that you think need some training or would like some help in understanding these platforms, whether it be in a one-to-one capacity that I've done with some athletes or a group capacity, uh, which I've done as well, um, you know, please reach out, uh, Sean at SportsGeek HQ and ask me more. Um, I'm really enjoying working with Jackson Frew, a young mountain biker, um, on what he's doing in, in social and uh, he, helping him understand the space. This is a young and upcoming mountain biker. Um, and, you know, I've liked working with um, a few AFL and NRL guys over the over the journey as well as doing some of those group sessions with, uh, with Olympic teams. So potentially there might be some work uh, with the Commonwealth Games coming up or uh, uh, potentially with the AFL and NRL uh, new batch of players coming in. Um, there's always athletes needing a little bit more help and... And the main thing is, is that platforms keep changing. So we've got digital teams here trying to keep on top of all of these platforms and they're just keeping their head above water. And we're, yet we're expecting athletes to, uh, uh, to, to just stay on top of it all. Um, so uh, that's it for this episode. Um, if you're listening to this episode almost immediately after I've, uh, it's been released... Um, you will find me at uh, the Sea Conference. Uh, sea Conference is in Atlanta this year. Um, I'm really looking. F- I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but potentially, by the time you've listened to this, I'll already be back. Um, <clears throat> but if you're in Atlanta or in LA, um, please reach out uh, either via uh, email or uh, the Sportsbiz Slack. Um, if you haven't joined the Sportsbiz Slack, please do so. Go to sportsgeekhq.com/slash/slack. Um, I'd love to have you involved. Um, And other than that, uh, you've been listening to the uh, Sports Geek podcast. Uh, One last thing, stay tuned for the sounds of the game. Thank you very much for Ben Kennings, uh, who grabbed a snippet of uh, audio at the Lions All Blacks game, um, which ended in a tie. Uh, They did not cut the trophy in half, but... uh, Absolutely phenomenal experience. Uh, I saw Shane Harmon's tweets uh, he's, uh, from Westpac Stadium. He said it was the loudest he's ever heard in the, in the stadium. So uh, thanks again for Ben for sending that. That's at the end of the game, uh, hearing the Lions fans um, going berserk. Uh, until next week, my name is Sean Cullinan and you've been listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. Join over 1,000 sports business executives in Sports Biz Slack. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash slack. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find out how to drive between eight and 30000 in profit for each digital campaign you sell sponsors. Check out sportsgeekcampaigns.com. Just like Jimmy Butler, you can call Sean anytime at 61-407-0407-200.